Yeah, we, we'll go ahead and record this for him. Um, we're in John chapter nine, but we took a little side road the last couple of weeks. And I think today we're probably going to finish up Job. We looked and that came up uh, thanks to Mark, his uh, insight on in John nine one, where uh, many when they when something bad happens, some illness, they either, you know, wonder what sin the person committed or they wonder you know how can god be loving if he allows this and that's kind of what was going on with job and his friends job's friends made the accusation that job was going through these troubles because there must be some hidden sin in his life and if he just confess and repent that that, that, that god would set him free from this judgment that god was obviously in their minds inflicting on job and and job he knew that there was nothing that he had done to bring this upon himself. God himself said that he was blameless. There's nobody like him. He, he feared God and he, uh, he, he, uh, what's the word he used? He turned away from evil. So Job knew there was nothing he did to bring this on. So the conclusion he came to is, well, then God must be unjust. God's God said, God's taken away my justice. He's, he's, treating me unfavorably so god must be unrighteous and both of them were wrong the the job's comforters comforters slash accusers and uh job himself and job or then god uh, rebukes all four of them and uh but in the end it looks like all four of them did repent and 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 uh so We'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. And one thing that you know we often hear is that you know that Job and that they don't they didn't uh, take into account that this was brought about by Satan. If you recall from the beginning, chapters one and two, Satan was the one that, that uh, instigated this. He he was going around on the earth looking for someone to devour, as like a roaring lion, and and God Himself even suggested, say, "Hey, have you considered my servant Job? There's nobody like him. He's blameless and upright, fears me, and turns away from evil." And and uh, so Satan, you know, made the accusation. He's the accuser. He made the accusation. Well, yeah, sure, Job fears you because you know he's look how you blessed him and you protected him. Take away all your blessings and protection, he's going to curse you to his to your face. So God allowed that. Sandra, you have something to share? Yeah, I was just wondering, like, I mean, we have the Bible to tell us that there is Satan, um, but how did they know, how could they have known in the Old Testament and stuff? Yeah, um, probably by oral tradition, it would have been passed down because uh, they passed down the story of Adam and Eve, right? The, the serpent in the garden that was passed down by oral tradition before it was ever recorded in scripture. They were known from that serpent. He was known as the serpent, and we'll take a look at that in a little bit. Remember, he said the serpent was more cunning, more sly, more cunning than any other creature. He came and deceived Eve, and I cursed him and said, as a result of this, you're going to crawl on your belly the, the rest of your life. And, and also, he said that, remember, he gave that prophecy about the seed of the woman, speaking of Christ, that... Right that uh, you're going to bruise people, but he's going to bruise your head, or crush your head, depending on the translation. So they didn't know that, and they passed that along, that this serpent, uh, Satan, is is going to be, be the tempter. He's going to be the deceiver. He's going to be the liar. So that would have been passed on. Um, okay. But like the rest of us, I mean, we even have, sometimes we forget we have an enemy, don't we? I mean, that's... I think that's yeah. one of Satan's uh, best ploys is to to make us forget that he even exists, or to convince people you know, that there's. I forget what the the, the uh, statistic is. The number of uh, professing Christians who believe in a, in a personal devil, um, and I have to wonder you know, if they're you know just professing believers, uh, or anyway, there's plenty of people in the church. That don't believe devil was a real person, a real being. So, and and we know he's the the accuser of the brethren. We'll look at that in 
Revelation 12, whenever we look at the dragon, he's called the dragon and the serpent in not just in Genesis 3, but also in Revelation 12, he's called the dragon with seven heads and uh, that that serpent of old, the, the twisted serpent, how he's the accuser of the brethren. And, and in Job's case, that's that's what he was doing with Job, wasn't he? He was accusing Job of of serving God only because of the, the blessings, only because he's been protected. And so he accused him, said, okay, yeah, we'll take away all your blessings and see if you really are going to fear God, really serve him. And, and just like today, you know, Satan, he used, he used Job's three friends as accusers, didn't he? They, they were accusing Job, they, they said, oh, you're, you've committed some sin. That's why God is bringing this judgment on you. They assumed this was God's judgment and they assumed that it was some sin that Job committed. So they were being tools. They were tools of Satan accusing accusing Job of some wrongdoing to bring it on himself. Although yeah. they did say, um, like when Job said that God was unjust, mm -hmm. whatever they said about God was true, right? True. They did say it was a lot of what they said was true. A lot of what Job said was true as well. Good point. Yeah, they did say a lot that was true. They said God is not unjust, which is certainly true. Uh, but what they didn't understand was that what God was allowing to happen to Job was not God's judgment. It was not judgment against any, uh, any outright wickedness against Job. God was using it to, as Elihu pointed out, God uses use these calamities to reveal our heart, reveal our pride, reveal our self righteousness, and so God did use that in that regard. It revealed the, the pride and self righteousness of Job, and also revealed it, the pride and self righteousness of his three comforters as well, his three three friends. So it was it's kind of ironic. It wasn't because of any. Uh, unrighteousness that Job was doing it was because of his self-righteousness that this came about because his, his reliance on his own righteousness Did, something else to share Sandra nope that was it okay so all right so so yeah so after Job's friends kept accusing him of some hidden sin Job of course had to he felt the need to defend himself and he declared his own righteousness and declared that, that God has been unjust and he demanded an audience with God he said I'm gonna you know present my case to him I'm gonna approach him like a prince and he finally got his opportunity in chapter 38 I think it is when God finally answered Job out of the whirlwind out of the storm yeah he answered him out of the whirlwind and said who is this that darkens counsel you darkened my counsel by words without knowledge you're talking about things you don't understand he said you know brace yourself like a man and i'm gonna i'll question you and you're gonna answer me so he goes through you know where were you when i laid the foundation of the world uh you know, do you he laid out all the the way god controls all the events of nature, all, all the the animal life, his power, the thunder, lightning, so forth, and kind of. Then we well, and then we got to uh, chapter forty when the Lord says to Job, "says Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God, the one who's accusing God, answer him." Job answered, and that's when Job finally realized, you know, I'm, after God showed him that he is just and he is holy and he is righteous and he's able to maintain this universe, Job finally saw that he was mistaken. He said, I said, I'm insignificant. I'm, I'm unworthy. He said, how can I reply to you? I'm, I'm putting my hand over my mouth. I'm covering my mouth. I spoke once, but I'm not going to speak anymore. I spoke twice and I'm not going to add any more. I, I spoke things I didn't understand. And then the Lord answered out of the storm again, gird up your loins like a man. I'm, I ask you and I'll instruct you. Will you really, in all my judgment, will you discredit my justice? Or are you going to condemn me so that you might be justified? And that's essentially what Job was doing is condemning God so that he would be justified. And, and we, we covered this last week, but I'll 
think it's worth repeating. It says, do you have an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? And then he lists some of his own qualities, some of God's divine qualities. Can you, if you said, okay, if you adorn yourself with eminence and dignity, if you clothe yourself with honor and majesty, if you put out, out the overflowings of your anger, look on everyone who's proud and make him low. Uh, if you look on everyone who's proud and humble him, tread down the wicked, hide them in the dust, bind them, etc. If you can do all this, Job, if you can put clothe yourself, array yourself like I am with the majesty, he says, then I'm going to confess to you that, that your own right hand can save you. Because that's essentially what Job was doing. He was, he was trying to state that his own right hand could save him, that, his, that he was a righteous enough person to, to be in the presence of God. And that's, you know, that's a, that's, we'll, we'll, we'll find out that's not the way to defend ourselves whenever Satan, oh, here comes Eileen. Let me admit her. We'll find out that that's not the way to defend ourselves against the attacks of the enemy. Um, and we, we know from when we look at Revelation 12, how do we overcome the dragon? That anybody have that memorized? Revelation 12, 11 through 13. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. A amen. Right. It's by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So, we don't overcome the dragon. We don't overcome Satan. Uh, oh, hi, Elaine. Hello. Glad to have you join us. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's been a while. So I'll catch you up real quick. We're, we were in studying John chapter 9, where the Jesus healed the blind man, the man that was born blind from birth. And the, mm. it's where the disciple asked Jesus, you know, who sinned? Why was this man born blind? Whose sin caused it? Of course, Jesus says it wasn't uh, because of his sin or his parents' sin. It was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And, and this God is thought, talking about how when someone experiences illness, sickness, some kind of trouble, the first thing some we, we tend to do as our self-righteous, sinful human beings that we are, we tend to think, okay, well, what sin did he commit to bring this upon himself? And then it was also brought up that we will go to the other extreme where we'll say, you know, why, why did this happen to me? Because I'm not a sinful person. What God must be unjust if he's allowing this. You know, this must not be a loving God if he's allowing uh, good old me to experience these illnesses. So as a result of that, we started looking at, at the book of Job because that's what was going on there. Job's friends were accusing Job. Job went through a lot of hardships, troubles, illnesses. His friends said, oh, it's because you've committed a sin. And Job took the other sin, the other side and he said, no, he said, I haven't committed any sin. I'm, I'm righteous. It's because God is being unjust that these things are happening to me. So that brings us up to where we are now. We're up to chapter 40 in Job. We, we did a quick study of Job the last two weeks, and we're up to chapter 40 of Job, where Job finally gets his audience with God, finally gets to present his case to God, and we find that Job has very little to say, because uh, God proves to him that he is uh, holy and righteous and, and just, that he, that he can, if God can maintain, create and maintain this universe and everything in it, he can be trusted and counted to be treat to treat us fairly and for our good and so that's what in chapter 40 the lord says to job says speaking to job says will the fault finder the one who's contending with the almighty uh, let him the one who accuses god answer it and job answers that's where job says i i'm insignificant i'm unworthy i'm vile he says i said things that i shouldn't have i'm so I'm going to cover my mouth now. I spoke things I didn't understand. And the Lord answers him in a storm. He says, up your voice like a man. He says, I will ask you and you will instruct me. He says, will you really in all my judgment? Will you discredit my justice? Will you condemn me so that you might be justified? And so that's essentially what Job was doing. He didn't, I don't think he realized he was doing that because uh, that well, because, because we know that Job feared God and turned away from evil. So I don't know that he intentionally was trying to condemn God, but that's essentially what he was he was doing. And so he says, you know, you're you're condemning me so that you can justify yourself. He says, can you 
and so God lists more of his qualities, and then he says to Job, says, if you, if you can adorn yourself like I am, then I'll confess to you that your own right hand can save you. And that's, and that's what a lot of us, at, not just Christians, but as non-Christians, before we see our sinfulness, we, we tend to think that our own right hand can save us, that, our, that I, if I'm a good enough person, that I, I can be saved. And that's what every religion in the world does, doesn't it? It, it says if you're, if you're good enough, then you're going to get into heaven. If you're not good enough, you're not going to get into heaven. So you're essentially relying on your own right hand to save you. you Elaine, know. did you have something to share? I know she unmuted. You know, I, I just was curious as to the, the, um, about our own, our own righteousness, um, because my, my concern is if you, if you, but believe, mm -hmm. Um, and isn't there more to that than just believing you don't, you have, have to show that belief, demonstrate that belief. Sure. There's going to be, it, it's, it's going to be like James chapter two or Ephesians two, eight through 10. You know, we're, we're not saved by good works, but we're saved for good works. It, there's going to be an evidence of it. Absolutely. But right. still, we don't trust in that evidence. You know, it's the good works are the fruit, not the root of our salvation. That's it's the result of being saved. So, but good, good point. Tom, you had something to share? Well, I just, um, I think she, I think Elaine said, don't you have to demonstrate? And I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know if you, I don't think you could help but demonstrate the work that Christ has done in you. It's, Amen. I don't know. I, and I wouldn't want to look at it as an obligation other than one of, or, or more of a compulsion of, you know, I love Christ, so I want to do what he wants me to do. Amen. Right. And I think that's where I struggle because I've been witnessing with one, I've been praying for decades for one person's soul. And um, he, sa he says all the time, well, I believe, I believe. You know, I know that at the end of my life, because I believe um, that God is going to allow me to enter. And I said, but you but you don't demonstrate that you you say that, but you you do things that are contrary to his word. And I don't I'm not trying to be your judge. I'm trying to be your friend. I want to make sure that I see you again. Right. But he just says, well, I believe, isn't that, it says that I just need to believe. I believe. Yeah. And well, and we, and we saw that in, as we were going through the study of John in chapter two, the end of chapter two, if you remember, there were many that believed on Jesus, but it said Jesus himself did not entrust him to that himself to them because he knew what was in the heart of man. So there's a, there's a difference between, you know, intellectual belief where we, yeah, sure. I believe all the facts about Jesus, and there's a difference between that and a true saving faith where we're throwing ourselves at his, in his, at his mercy, putting our life in his hands, saying, I'm wretched. I have no chance of saving myself. Jesus, I'm putting my life in your hands. And when we do that, we become born again. We become a new creation dwelt by the Holy Spirit. And as Tom said, we can't help but be different. We, he changes us. We become a new creation and we we want to obey out of, it, it's just our, the new nature he's given us. We, it's almost like, I, I don't want to say we don't have a choice because we have a choice, but we, we just can't help. Well, you but, can't help yourself. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, that's how, and that's how I see it. I think you have to, you know, my daddy always said, you may be the only Bible people ever read. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's important, but my concern is that we, and I've heard it too from the pulpit. If you just believe, you you say that you believe and you mean that you believe. But I think when people hear that, they think, okay, well, I believe, so I'm good. Yeah, yeah. When we say that, we need to define what true belief is, true saving faith is. That's what I said last week about there's some words that we use. Yeah. But then in the heavenly vocabulary, they, they may be the same word, but they've got a totally different depth of meaning to them you know right. like like believe like in 
in Acts 16, where it says, you know, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household, and you should be, it means like a committed belief. It's like, it's a commitment. It's not right. just, it's not a belief, not some intellectual assent that, right. you know, I think that train will be in at 6 p.m. It's supposed to be, you know, it's, right. you know, it's going to be there. Yeah. And I, I like the illustration, like, you know, I, while well, you speak about train. Okay. Yeah. I know that, I know that this train, I like to use an airplane, but it, it could be the one. I know this, this airplane is going to leave at five o'clock and it's going to fly across the Atlantic ocean. I believe that. But if I just stand there and watch it, it's going to take off and go across the ocean without me. I, if I truly have belief in that plane, I'm going to get in, I'm going to get on board and allow it to carry me across the ocean. And that's, that's the same thing with, with belief in Christ. I can believe all the facts about him, but if I don't get on board, if I don't put my life in his hands and allow him to carry me through, through this life and into the next, I'm going to be on the other side in uh, that deep chasm and separated by the, in the lake of fire. So, yeah, so good point, Elaine. I, yeah, we, we need to find what we mean by, by belief and, and the, the result of that belief, how we're transforming. <laughs> so, but, but even so, once we do believe, our, our trust, our reliance, our righteousness before God, we're still trusting in the, the righteousness of Christ that's imputed to us, it's credited to our account. We don't, we're not, we should never be trusting in the righteousness that, that he's producing through me the, the righteous acts that 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 are the result of this transformation that, that's just the fruit that's not the that's not what i should be trusting in i'm trusting in christ alone and the result is fruit that's going to be produced by him so but what what job had been doing he was relying on his own righteousness the 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 righteous acts that he was uh, committing he was relying on that to save himself so he said if you but if you can adorn yourself with this perfect majesty like i have then i'll admit that you can save yourself so and then so then we got down to chapter 41 leviathan <clears throat> and when we look through here god says to job says can you and the name leviathan it means twisted serpent or, or coiling serpent it says can you draw out leviathan with a fish hook and you press down his tongue with a cord etc will he make supplications to you will he speak to you in soft words will he make a covenant with you will you take him for a servant forever and as we continued on here and looked at some other supporting scripture for instance we saw in isaiah isaiah 26 and 27 we'll go there again for to reinforce this isaiah the end of isaiah 26 and 27 oh where is it now you think i would know by now that it's on the other side of psalms okay i see 26 and 27 okay at the end of chapter 26 Uh, talking about this is talking about the the day of judgment isaiah 26 verse 21 says for behold the lord is about to come out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity and the earth will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer cover her slain in that day the lord will punish leviathan that fleeing serpent with his fierce and great and mighty sword even leviathan the twisted serpent he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. So that's going to happen on the day of judgment. And we saw in Revelation 12, talks, let's go to Revelation 12, talks about the dragon. Revelation 12, I think it's verse one or two, maybe. Let's see, verse three verse three is revelation 12 three another sign appeared in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and on his head were seven diadems with his, his tail swept away a third of the stars threw them to the earth the dragon stood before the woman about to give birth 
so that he might devour her child. And we'll jump down to verse 10. It says, a loud voice in heaven. Well, no, sorry, let's go to verse 9. Verse 9, the great dragon was thrown down, that serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan. Isn't that the same thing that we're just seeing there about Leviathan? And Sandra, I see you're unmuted. Sorry, do you have something to share? Yeah, I was just going to ask, that, so the dragon and the serpent, are they like two separate entities or are they just different names for Satan? Yeah, good question. I think, I, I don't know, somebody that knows more than I might say they're diff, they're separate entities, but I don't know. It sounds to me like they're one and the same, although I've heard some say that, you know, Satan has his holy trinity. Um, so I've heard that too about like yeah. the beast and the false prophet and all that. Yeah. So they're, they're all satanic, whether it's, you know, uh, an unholy trinity, whether it's all Satan, I, I don't, I don't have a real solid answer for you there, but, but maybe, maybe if we read here, maybe it'll become clearer to us. But in verse nine, it says, the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan. So there it sounds like it's all one, doesn't it? it sounds like the dragon, the serpent of old. It sounds like that devil and the Satan are all just names for the same, the same being. He deceives the whole world. So again, just like you know, Leviathan in Isaiah 27, he's called the, the serpent. He's called the dragon. Here in Revelation 12, he's called the serpent, the dragon, devil, and Satan. He, in Genesis 3, he was called the serpent. So he's going to be thrown down to earth, his angels with him. And in verse 10, I heard a loud voice saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of the brethren. That's Satan, the dragon, the, the serpent. The accuser of the brethren has been thrown down. He accuses them before our God day and night, just like he was doing with, with Job. They overcame him, not because they declared their own righteousness and that they were blameless. They didn't overcome him because they declared how, how good they were, how righteous they were. They overcame him because of the blood of the lamb, because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even to death. So that's how we overcome Satan. We don't, we don't want to do like Job did and say, look, I don't. I don't deserve to, to be to go through these trials because I'm a righteous person. Maybe you are a righteous person. And, and if you're in Christ, you are righteous because of the uh, the imputed righteousness of Christ. And that's what we want to declare is the is Christ's righteousness, his blood. I, I was bought with the uh, with a price, with the precious blood of Jesus. He washed me in his blood. That's why I'm righteous and, and acceptable in God's sight. It's not because I'm a good person, anything that good that came out of me is a result of what Christ has done in me and through me. It's all because of him. And that, that's our testimony. That's the word of our testimony. That's the blood of the, the lamb that we, that, that, that overcomes Satan. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. So, and then we see in Chapter 20, Revelation 20, we're going to see that the, let's see, where is it? Uh, Revela Revelation 20, verse 1, see an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss, great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, same thing again. And he bound him for a thousand years, threw him into the abyss, shut it and sealed it over so that he should not deceive the nations any longer. He deceived Job. He deceived the, the three comforters. He deceives everyone in the, in the world. Then he'll be released for a short time. Uh, let's see. After the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. He'll come out and he'll deceive the nations again. Uh, the devil, and then finally the devil... Verse 10, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So that sounds like that, that unholy trinity that you referred to, Sandra. Sounds like perhaps the devil and the, the beast and the false prophet, maybe there are three, I don't know if you want to call them three heads of Satan or three, I don't know. I don't, I'm not, 
I'm not an expert in that area, but anyway, they're going to be thrown into the, the lake of fire and brimstone, be tormented day and night forever. And also anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. And that's essentially what was stated back in Isaiah 26 and 27 on that final day when Leviathan is going to be punished along with every wicked person whose name is not in the Lamb's Book of Life. Hey, Jim. Yeah, Tom. Can you take a guess on this? Do you think that they are spiritual entities or are they physical entities or because everything I know about Satan, it just seems like he's always demons that's inhabiting somebody or something, you know? So I, are they just yeah. different essences or are they what? I, I think it's spiritual because the, you know, we don't see the demons today, right. we see Satan, but yet we obviously see his influence and we, we know that, the demons can inhabit people we saw that in jesus day and throughout the gospels so i think i think there's spiritual beings that can inhabit and they certainly can influence people they, I don't pigs think, hey, yeah right pigs <laughs> <laughs> definitely influence some pigs yeah so i yeah i think it's spiritual that yeah and, me too yeah now i don't believe that they can inhabit a born again child of God. I think they can influence us. They're going to attack us. They're going to, they can deceive us. I, they can, they're definitely going to accuse us for certain. They're going to seek who they can devour, but I don't think they can actually inhabit a, a born again child of God because the Holy spirit is, is residing in us. So I don't think they can reside alongside the Holy spirit like that. Sandra, you have a yeah, I mean, that passage comes to mind, the one that when Jesus looked at Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. So mm -hmm. obviously, Peter was a believer, right? At that point. I um, think he was. He gave all appearances of being a believer. And Satan was not in him, but influencing him. And that's why Jesus said that. He, he certainly that was him. influencing him, wasn't he? Yeah, I don't, I don't think he was. Yeah, I don't think. Peter wasn't dwelt by Satan, but he was certainly being influenced by him. The words he was speaking were words that Satan would have spoken, weren't they? Um, right. So, so we need to exercise discernment even among believers. We can't just kind of like say, oh, they're all a group of believers. Therefore, I can, you know, just take off absolutely. my hat, you know, because Satan Amen. does work even among believers, right? He does, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Pardon me, Elaine? To her point, wolf's, wolf in sheep's clothing. Amen, yep. That's right, yep. Tears among wheat. Yeah, yep. Yeah, gr great point, Sandra. Yeah, we need to exercise discernment. Uh, and and even, you know, even if it's not a... Uh, we, we do exercise discernment even in our our thoughts you know take every thought captive make sure because satan can he can plant thoughts in our minds can he and so we need to make sure that that we're the voice we're hearing that we're listening to the voice of god the voice of the holy spirit and not the the voice of satan the enemy jim so, that was one of my biggest challenges while i was going through my health challenge these last several months yeah. is that i knew i just kept rebuking him um, you know, and kind of telling him that my mind was not his battleground, but that was a constant, almost daily. Mm. Yeah. Hey Amen. Good point. Thanks, Elaine. Yeah, it's not, it's not like one, you know, the, the moment we get born again that we finally have complete victory over the enemy. It's a, it's a constant day by day, moment by moment, isn't it? And even just getting up in the morning, praying every morning isn't enough it's 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 every moment every every breath we take it's so easy to to get distracted and be uh misled by the evil one so yeah thanks there was, there was an old uh there was an old theologian john owen i don't know if you know but he mm -hmm. he 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 compared our lives to being a lifelong boxing match you know if you drop your hand for one second you're going to get hit you know, I mean, if you drop your, if you drop your guard of depending on 
Christ and his spirit to yeah. keep you and sustain you and all that, you're going to get clocked. I mean, he's just going yeah. to look for any opening at all. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Let's take a look, since you might brought that up, let's take a look at James and Peter both address this. Let's see. James and Peter, if I can remember where that is. Uh, let's see. Chapter five. Where does James say to humble yourself? Let's see. Is, it, is that like four? Oh, here it four? is. It is chapter four. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Yeah, James 4, verse 6, he gives greater grace. Therefore, it says God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So submit, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Mm -hmm. So the, I mean, we're, we're probably familiar with resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But there's a condition before that. We've got to humble ourselves. If we're proud, like like Job and his his friends were um the devil isn't going to flee from us so we have to humble ourselves submit to god and then resist the devil and he'll flee from us so that that's what what god had to do with job and job did to his credit in the end he did he humbled himself he submitted to god he resisted the devil resisted the devil and he fled from him and and peter says something similar uh, let's see where that is. Let's see. Oh, okay, there's chapter five. Yeah, it's First Peter chapter five. That's why I couldn't find it in James. I was looking the wrong book. Uh, let's see. Okay, verse First Peter chapter five, verse five. You younger men, be subject to your elders, and all of you, all of you, whether you're young or old. Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. We're all familiar with that one. And then verse 8, be sober, be a sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring, roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. So again, it talks about resisting the devil, but the key again is humbling ourselves, submitting to God, being firm in your faith, trusting, don't trust in the faith isn't faith in me, faith in my ability. My, my faith is in Christ and what he has done and what he continues to do for me. So, but you know, man, I get so encouraged by the fact that if we resist, it does say he will flee from us. Yeah. You know, that's, that's amazing to me. Yeah. Amen. But it's, but he's, he's fleeing because of Christ, isn't he? He's, right. he's not fleeing. Right. He's not fleeing. Just like, remember what God told Job in, in chapter 40 about Leviathan? Oh, wait, is it 40? No, chapter 41. Um says, lay your hand on him. If you lay your hand on him, you'll remember the battle and you don't do it again. So we can't think that we can defeat Leviathan or defeat Satan by our own ability. We can't do it. We don't stand a chance. It's only because of Christ. Christ has defeated him. He defeated him at the cross. That was prophesied in Genesis 3. said, Satan is going to strike your heel, but you're going to crush his head. That was prophesied in uh, Psalm 74 when it says, that you crush the heads of Leviathan. So Christ is the one who defeated him. We stand firm in the faith that Christ has defeated him. Then we resist the devil and he'll flee from us. So, yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Tom. So, yeah, don't try to defeat Satan or Leviathan on our own. So you try it, you're not going to do it again. You're going to get your, your lunch eaten. You're going to get your... 
behind kicked. It says, no one is so fierce that he dares to arouse him, arouse, arouse Leviathan. Who then, if you can't defeat Leviathan, what makes you think you can stand before me? Who is given to me that I should repay him? We don't, God doesn't owe us anything. Doesn't even someone as righteous as Job, God owes him nothing. The whole heaven is mine. And then Job 41, talk, speaking about Leviathan, in verse 24, his heart is as hard as stone. That certainly <laughs> describes Satan, Leviathan. He's got a heart as hard as stone, as hard as a lower millstone. Verse 33, oh, well, here we go. How about verse 31? He makes the depths boil like a pot. He makes the sea foam like a jar of ointment. That's, isn't that what Satan always doing? He's always causing turmoil, ca causing stirring things up, causing chaos. And it says he does that to the sea, makes it foam like a jar of ointment. Did you happen to see, I don't know if you saw it, I think it was last week I sent it. It was a, a little uh, excerpt from the Daily Bread um, on the sea, gave some insight on the sea. The word for the sea, it's actually used over 400 times in the Old Testament, and it means more than just that, you know, that body of water that we think of out there. You know, it's, it's like, it's like the sea of humanity. It's, it's where, uh, in, I think it's another psalm, where is it, where it says that God created the sea for Satan, for uh, Leviathan, which is Satan. He created the sea for Leviathan to frolic. Leviathan frolics in the sea. And isn't that what Leviathan, like what Satan does? He frolics in the sea, the sea of humanity. That's where, that's his playground, is the, 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 the world, this, the, the sea of humanity, where there's all kinds of turmoil and chaos. Sandra, do you have something to share? Yeah, so I was just going to say, like, some of these study Bibles and stuff, they mention in the notes that it's some sort of, uh, like, sea dinosaur or something. Um, so that's not correct then, right? I, I don't it's think so. I, I have to disagree with that. I, 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 I don't see how I can come up to any other conclusion other than this is Satan. When you look at the other scriptures that support it, yeah, so it's not an actual creature in the sea at all. Like, if we go and search the sea, we'll never find it. I don't think so. And there's some that say, oh, it's a, it was a prehistoric or some kind of prehistoric dinosaur that's extinct. I don't know. Maybe there was a, an actual fire-breathing dragon because we saw in Job 41, it says, out of his mouth go burning torches, sparks of fire leap forth, out of his nostrils smoke goes forth. A boiling pot, burning rushes, his breath kindles coals, a flame goes forth from his mouth. That sounds like a fire-breathing dragon to me. Was there ever such a thing? I don't know. There's lots of mythology that talks about fire-breathing dragon. Um, but I, I'm I'm convinced that it's that it's, that it's Satan that based on the other scriptures that support that. So it's like how Tom said, spiritual. It's a, it's on it's purely spiritual. You're never gonna find like a actual serpent in the sea that you can feel and touch yeah i don't yeah i agree with that i don't think there is i don't think it is a physical creature right. and he took on now maybe he could take on that feature those features like he did in the garden with the serpent i don't know maybe i guess that's possible yeah uh, yes but, but i but it certainly sounds like satan to me well, you know what else? I mean, I think about it even back in Genesis where it says that God created a male and a female of each kind. Mm -hmm. it, I, I, don't, I don't think God created that thing, you know? I mean, I, it, it could be, it can be the spiritual thing we're talking about. I don't think there was an actual yeah. thing because God didn't create it. Yeah, there's only ever one leviathan mentioned it's not like a male and female leviathan it's not like yeah, mr and mrs leviathan yeah yeah right I, yeah right yeah it's just it's always in the singular like like satan lucifer the you know he was the morning star and when he fell so yeah um let's see oh so anyway yeah so he he makes, let's see, where is it? Job 41. Uh, he makes the seed foam like a jar of ointment. He's always stirring up, causing chaos. That word 
for C, it's yam, Y-A-M. It means to roar. That's that, that root word for C means to roar. And I thought that was kind of interesting because Satan is called a roaring, he roams about like a roaring lion. And the sea, you know, think of the sea roaring. And, and that's Satan, that's Leviathan's playground, the, the sea, the sea of humanity. And that's what he does. He roars, he, he stirs things up, he causes chaos, he causes turmoil, causes things to foam up. It says, there's nothing on earth like him, one made without fear. He looks on everything that is high, that is haughty. He is king over all the sons of, proud, of pride. Well, that describes Satan to a T. He's the king of the sons of pride. Everyone who's, who's proud and haughty, is, is he's their king. But those that are humble... And meek, Jesus is their king. So you're either a you know subject of Satan or you're subject of Jesus. So then in Job 42, then Job finally answered the Lord and said, I know, now I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. He, he's, he sees the light now. He sees that God is all powerful. He is the Almighty and He is just. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You said, you asked, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? It was me. Therefore, I declared things I did not understand, things that were too wonderful for me, which wonderful for me, which I did not know. And that's true of all of us. Isaiah 55, as, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are your ways higher than our ways. We can't fully comprehend God. We can trust him that he is good. No matter what we're going through, we can trust him. That, and I think that's the point of Job, the book of Job. No matter what we're going through, like Elaine, you're going through those health issues. You can trust. We know we can trust God that he is good. Don't let Satan try to deceive you and, and convince you that God is, is unjust. Don't try to convince him that he's you know, pouring out wrath on you because of something you've done. Now, if you're not a believer, that's another story. There will be wrath poured out at, at the end. But Elaine, do you have something to share there? Oh, well, I, it was just funny when, when this started, one of my brothers came to my bedside and he said, you know, oftentimes this is a spiritual battle. You need to look into, you know, do a self-examination and see how you may have not done something pleasing to God. And I said, I don't think he punishes us that way. Um, I, you know, I think it's Satan. Sure. I'm, I'm always, well, always is a strong term, but you know, self-reflecting, but mm -hmm. I don't think he's punishing me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I have to agree with that. Um, Cause it, Jesus took, if you're a child of God, Jesus took all of your punishment. There is no condemnation. There is no punishment. Now he, he does discipline us. Um, would he discipline us like that? I don't know. Um, how, about, how about Romans five, five, where it says that, you know, he delivered one over to, satan uh that his flesh might be destroyed that his soul might be saved yeah that that was first corinthians five yeah um oh, okay. that was one that was someone who was who was professing to be a believer but he was living in blatant sin and he was proud of it that was that was the, the bad thing about it he was they were they were proud they were boasting about this sin and so, yeah, he delivered him over to Satan so that his flesh might be destroyed and his soul would be saved. Um, what exactly that mean? I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, what did that look like? Does that just mean he was excommunicated from the church? Um, yeah, I don't know. His flesh be destroyed. His flesh being, yeah, well, okay. Yeah, yeah I don't, I don't know. know. Now, is that the same as in Galatians 6, where those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh? Is that what he's referring to there? I, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know exactly what, what that meant in 1 Corinthians 5. But yeah, he was turned over to Satan. He, he was claiming to be a believer, but he was living in blatant sin and boasting about it. That was the bad thing. They were, they were boasting about it. So, I mean, I can understand a believer being trapped in sin and you, you know, you're, you're struggling with it and you want to get out and you can't figure out how to you know, understand how you can get out of that sin. But if you're boasting in it, I'd have to seriously question whether 
whether Christ is living in you, whether the Holy Spirit's living in you, because that that's not it's definitely not coming from Christ. It's not coming from the Holy Spirit to cause you to to boast in in your sin. Um, you know, Second Corinthians thirteen five says, "Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the in the faith. You know that Christ is in you." So I think it's good for us to you know examine ourselves. Do we know that Christ is in us? If Christ is in me, he's, he's not going to encourage me to live a sinful life. He's going to encourage me to live an obedient life. So, I don't know. Any, do you have anything else to add on that, Tom? No, I, I just I just thought it was interesting. I, I just think it's, it's too, in my personal case, it's too hard for me to discern the difference of why I get sick and why I don't get sick and that kind of thing. I mean, there's, there's just too many variables and things between it. I can't always say it's, yes, this is because God wanted this, or this is, this one isn't because God wanted this. Or, right. I don't know. I'm just and not think, that. Yeah. And I think we're going to put ourselves in bondage. If we, if every time we get sick, every time, time something bad happens, we think, okay, God, what am I doing? What did I do wrong this time? Well, you probably didn't do anything wrong. I mean, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, we did something wrong. We, every day we do something wrong. But like with the man born blind, it, it's probably it's a good chance it's not something that you, that's, you did wrong that's caused that to happen. It could be just say that the works of God might be manifested in you. And, and when we're going through difficult times, like Elaine, when you're going through that sickness, it's, it's opportunities to testify to God's grace, the glory of God. And Tom, when you were going through COVID, you know, maybe, you know, this is terrible. I hate this, but I'm going to rejoice because I have a savior who loves me, who died for me, who's going to bring me into glory someday. This is just a temporary body. You know, I, I want to use it for his glory as long as I can. But I know that, I've, that I'm only a, a, a pilgrim passing through here. My, my home is in heaven. And anything that causes me to seek him and to, to desire to, you know, be in relationship with him is a good thing for me. E even if it's, even if it's an ugly thing by my human standard, Amen. you know, I mean, I feel like that even about my divorce and stuff, you know, even, even though I hate that dreadfully, but if it draws me to seek the cross, then it's, it's about his glory. It's not about my story. Amen. It's about his glory. Amen. Great point. Yeah. Yeah. And think about that. Probably when we've been at our lowest points and going through the most the most terrible things in our lives is probably when we've been we've relied on on the Lord most heavily. So yeah. Amen. Thanks. Great point, Tom. Yeah. All right. So. Anyway, Job says, I declared things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. You said, hear now, and I will speak. So I'm going to ask you, Job, and you're going to instruct me. He says, Job, therefore, said, I had, I had heard of you before I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. And I think that ties in with what you had shared, Elaine. This, I think Job's talking about the difference here between mere intellectual belief and true saving faith said so i'd heard about you i knew about you i believed some things about you but now my eyes have seen you i the the scales have come off my eyes i i see you now lord I, you're not just a this impersonal god up here now i see you you're, you're personal you're real to me therefore i retract i despise myself i repent in dust and ashes i think that's the moment that that job was truly saved he, he saw the light and i think that's the point the, 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 that crisis that we all have to get to at some point when we see just how wretched we are and how glorious and holy God is and how magnificent we, we despise ourselves. We repent in dust. We see that we're, we're wretched and we repent in dust and ashes. And after the Lord spoke these words to Job, the Lord said to his friend Eliphaz, my wrath is kindled against you and against your friends because you have not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job has. And what did Job speak that was right? It's, it's all right there in those first couple verses. He's what what he's finally spoke about God. 
right? Is that nothing, no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Uh, I know that you can do all things. I know that you are glorious. And I know that I'm, I'm insignificant compared to you. They didn't say those things. They, they were essentially saying, they were essentially saying to Job, look, Job, you're having these bad things happening because you've sinned. And what they're implying is we haven't had these bad things happen because we're good. We're, we're, we're righteous and you're not. That's essentially what they're saying. They were, they were implying that, that, that they weren't having bad things happening because they were, they were right with God because of their own righteousness. So he says, you haven't spoken what is right as my servant Job has. Therefore, take for yourself seven bulls, seven rams, go to my servant Job, offer up a burnt offering for yourselves to, to, to cover these sins of yours. My servant Job will pray for you. I will accept him so that I may not do to you according to your folly, because you have not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job has. So they did. They, they apparently repented as well. They saw their folly. They did what, as the Lord told them, and, and the Lord accepted Job and and the Lord restored Job's fortunes. So, I don't know. Anybody have anything else to add? I think, Tom, I think you'd, well, I, I think got you yeah. had some good, good stuff to share. So, so whenever we're going through bad things and, uh, you know, don't accuse God of being unjust. Don't, and don't allow Satan to accuse you to think that you're, that God somehow, punishing you if you're a child of God don't think that, that don't allow him to convince you that God's punishing you for something that you've done that you don't even you're not even aware of don't don't fall into that trap uh, hit, allowing him to condemn you don't don't fall into the trap of thinking that God's unjust allow him to use it for his glory to draw you closer to him be a witness for for Christ amen amen all right Anybody like to pray for us? Amen. Elaine, did you have something? To, to sh- no, I just said amen. Okay. All right. Great. Would somebody like to pray for us? Uh, I can't right now. Okay. All right. Anybody else like to pray for us? Okay. I'll, I'll pray for us if nobody else wants to. Uh, Father, thank you for your amazing love, your holiness, your, your righteousness, your justice, that, and your, your mercy towards us. Thank you that we can trust you no matter what we're going through, that Jesus, you took all the wrath, all the punishment that we deserved. And Father, you're, you're no longer punishing your children, and we, we know that, that you do allow some things to, to happen, but we pray that you would be glorified th- through these difficulties. We'd have opportunities to speak the gospel, to proclaim the goodness of Christ to those that hear. Uh, give us boldness and, and opportunities to declare your, your gospel of grace. And we pray this all, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. 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 Uh, hey, Jim, if you don't yeah. mind, um, I have two prayer requests. Um, sure. Continued prayer for my um, full restoration. Yeah. But um, you probably have seen um, in the paper or on the news that there was a floating accident on the Swatara Creek, and my friend Steve Matrice died in that um, accident, and he was with his life group from church. So pray for not only his, his children and his granddaughter and his family, his parents, and, but for his, his church family and for those who knew him in so many different circles he was truly a um his mission in life was to to bring as many people to christ as he could gather yeah wow what was his name again steve matrice steve matrice okay tom i know you have to go so we won't hold you but can we uh pray for those things right now elaine is that okay sure um jim i'm gonna drop off too because i have a one o'clock meeting okay all right yeah all right Uh, 
Father, we, we thank you for the, the healing that you've begun in Elaine's body, and we pray that you continue that so that she can uh, be fully restored and and uh, come back to the things that she's has enjoyed in the, in the past. I pray, Lord, that you use this for your glory uh, as you've drawn her closer to you and and given her opportunities to, to witness to your goodness to her. And, so, Lord, we, we commit her health into your hands. And also, uh, Lord, the family, all that's involved, we're, all that's involved with this tragedy, that, that drowning, Lord, uh, as Elaine shared, he had a, a desire to, to lead many to you, to trust in Jesus. And, Lord, perhaps this is one opportunity where many will see the look back, reflect on the life that he lived, the, the testimony that he had of, of your grace, the gospel of Jesus, and that you would use this to, to draw many to you. Also for the family, that they might find comfort knowing that, that he's in your hands and that they can join, be rejoined with him soon and in your glorious kingdom. Father, we pray all this for your honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Jim. You're welcome. All right. Well, we'll see you all. Have a blessed rest of the week. Thanks. You too. All right. We'll see you, Mark. Goodbye. Bye. Mark. Yep. Thank you. Bye.